Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash on October 17th, 2018 for This Week in Prophecy. Jacob. The possibility of war on two fronts. That becomes a distinct possibility in Israel. First of all, it was announced this week in prophecy by the Israeli National Parks Authority that a total of 7,000 acres have been destroyed by incendiary balloons launched by Hamas from Gaza. 7,000 acres of reforested land, roughly 50% of southern Israel's reforested land. These fires have spread so far and it becomes so out of control at points that it's reached the outskirts of fairly major population centers, including Lod, including Beersheba, and including uh, Kiryat Gat. The fires approaching Lod put in danger the operational capacity of Ben Gurion Airport, Israel's major national airport its point of air contact with the outside world and for certain domestic flight operations. Any kind of an environmental threat to that region that would <coughs> saturate the atmosphere with smoke and obstruct air navigation would be highly, highly problematic for Israel commercially and in terms of its pure um, economic viability, as well as the environmental and strategic impact of these fires. Avidor Lieberman, the Israeli Defense Minister, has announced the following. All efforts have been exhausted to stop the launching of these balloons. There is nothing capable of stopping it now other than a significant ground and air offensive. A significant ground, air, and naval offensive. It's the only way. The world has underreported the significance of these balloons and the incendiary devices they're carrying, but they're also now carrying explosives, meaning that the balloons themselves will not only set fires, but have the potential to bomb miniature targets and kill people without even having any reference to the fires. So they're serving a dual purpose now. They're spreading the fires and the forest fires, but they're also becoming small bombs. Again, Mr. Lieberman says there is no way to stop it. They have tried and exhausted every possibility they have strategically and diplomatically to stop these balloons. Mr. Lieberman has announced that with the failure of all efforts diplomatically and militarily and technologically to stop these balloons, the ground offensive is the only remaining viable option to stop the balloons, especially since population centers are being threatened, since Ben Gordian Airport is potentially being threatened, and since now incendiary devices are being doubled or augmented by detonation devices. This is quite serious, and again, it is being underreported by the global media. So, of course, when Israel is forced to respond, we can rely, as usual, on the BBC, CNN, etc., to portray Israel as the aggressor. Nonetheless, that is what is transpiring this week in prophecy. This week, the U.S. Justice Department, the Trump administration, and Attorney General Jeff Sessions have added Hezbollah, Hezbollah the Iranian-backed terrorist organization in Lebanon, to a list of five major agencies involved in international crime and drug trafficking, along with M13 and so forth. The one that was left off, of course, is the state-sponsored production of cocaine by the regime in Bolivia that's increasingly associated with communist China. But now Hezbollah has been added. Drug trafficking has always been a major staple income for Islamic terror from Afghanistan through the Middle East, but now Hezbollah has been added as a criminal organization. This takes place at the same time as Hezbollah's role together with Iran and the Assad regime in Syria comes to a strategic confrontation with Israel along the border of the Golan Heights, 
More of that in just a moment. But this week in prophecy, Benjamin Netanyahu has had to address the fact that there's not been any Israeli air attacks into Syria since the deployment of the S-300 and S-400 Russian anti-aircraft missile systems and advanced radar deployments. Also, since the downing of the Russian reconnaissance plane killing 19 Russian airmen. The conflict between Israel and Russia came to a point for the first time since the war of attrition in the 1970s, as we've previously reported. Mr. Netanyahu says it is important that he continues to engage Mr. Putin to avoid this and to enlist the help of Mr. Putin in restricting the Iranian presence anywhere near the border with Israel on the Golan Heights. Mr. Putin, of course, cannot be trusted. Mr. Netanyahu knows this, but there is more afoot than we are being told. The Israelis are looking to take quick delivery, not of the American F-35 stealth fighter, but of a modified F-15 that is uh, sometimes referred to as the secret eagle. It is better capacitated to avoid certain kinds of Russian, Chinese, and other radar technology than stealth aircraft. Um, it also has a much higher payload, a further range, and is more operational. It may be that until Israel has re-equipped itself to deal with the new threat of the S-300, S-400, and possibly even coming at some point, an even more advanced Russian missile system being deployed against Israeli aircraft in Syria to essentially modify its aerial attack capacity. The F-35 has been seen as overestimated by both American and Israeli test pilots in combat scenarios. Avionics engineers point to its deficits and its deficiencies, as well as to its superior operating capacity in certain spheres. But when it was designed, it did not take into account advances in Soviet radar systems or Soviet and Chinese anti-aircraft missile systems. Hence, there is a shifting in the budgetary plans to purchase F-35s, reducing the number from the original number, which was above 75, down to approximately one squadron, uh, in order to be able to acquire more F-35s that can operate secretly, uh, more effectively and invasive of these advanced Russian radars than the F-35 can. The Americans, of course, have not deployed and said they will not in any way sell the F-22 outside of the United States or outside of the United States Air Force. No one has it or will have access to it. Now, this is a, an advanced plane that may well have a performance capacity superior to the F-35 and to the F-15 SE, the Secret Eagle, but it's technology is so advanced the United States is not putting it on the market at the present time. The battlefield expectations have intensified along the Golan Heights. Mr. Netanyahu has been again engaging with Mr. Putin to try to use Russian influence to keep Iranian and Iranian-backed forces such as Hezbollah away from the Golan Heights to a distance of perhaps 50 to 60 kilometers, in some demands up to 83 kilometers, but that's much less likely to happen. Again, what we are looking at may be the preparation of some kind of an Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario. We do not want to be the proverbial boy who cried wolf and say this is it or it's coming, but as we've been saying consistently, watch this space. Russian troop deployments have now reached 63 to 65,000 inside Syria. That is well beyond the numbers of American troops deployed in 
Afghanistan and Iraq together, well beyond. Russians have made a major, major investment. It is part of their revamping the lost image and credibility they had as a strategic power in the aftermath of the collapse of the Iron Curtain. Mr. Putin, again, is driven by a resentment of having lost the Cold War above all else. That is what motivates him more than anything else. There are other considerations. He would like a stability in the Middle East to artificially drive up the price of Russian oil and natural gas and so forth. These are also factors in his equation. Nonetheless, he sees Syria as his base of operations to begin to rebuild what the Soviet war machine had been and to restore Russian integrity as he would personally envision it. He has done this in Crimea. He has done this on the border with the Ukraine. He has done this internally within Russia. And now he is doing it in the Middle East. And he's doing it this week in prophecy. 65,000 Russian troops is a formidable, formidable deployment. But let's continue this week in prophecy. Ironically, there has been an increase since June of Turkish and Israeli cooperation despite the bad blood between them and the distrust of Recep Erdogan by the Israelis in view of what transpired with the famed flotilla in which nine Turkish citizens were killed by the Israeli Navy. This resentment has basically eclipsed all Israeli-Turkish relations since the time of the flotilla, which is already now several years old. But mutual interest will always prevail in the Middle East. Turkey is seeking to gain Israeli guarantees not to arm separatist Kurdish forces operational in Syria and Iraq that could support or could join with the Kurdish PKP fighters inside of Turkey itself. It is an Israeli threat that is persistent and has always been there. And Turkey is keen to see these Kurds not be armed either by the United States or by Israel. Hence, Turkey has been forced to come around and somewhat climb down and increase its intelligence and defense cooperation, both with the United States, but more especially with Israel, following an agreement of June 28th of this year. But this week in prophecy, what everybody has already known, was formally released to the public. Let us continue this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, a Sino-Iranian, that is a joint Chinese-Iranian constructed and designed submarine called the Gadir class, was practicing maneuvers to sink a mock American aircraft carrier in the Straits of Hormuz at the entrance to the Persian Gulf. Well, somehow, the submarine did not function too well and it inexplicably almost sunk. There are not believed to be any survivors, and it is uh, a word that I've been seeing banted around more recently, Schadenfreude, a word in both Yiddish and in German, meaning when you take pleasure in catastrophe coming upon your enemies or components. It is a subject for some gloating in Saudi Arabia and in the Persian Gulf states, which are Sunni-controlled, and are at odds with the Shia-controlled regime of Iran. But it happened, and it happened this week. Meanwhile, Sultan Qaboos bin Said al-Said, that is the Sultan of Oman, is announced to be dying of a cancer that may be now untreatable. He's been out of the country for up to two, two and a half months at a time in Germany and Europe getting medical treatment, but his state is degenerating by some reports rather quickly. 
This will create a big question mark in the Arabian Peninsula and in the Persian Gulf. He backs the Houthi rebels against the regime supported by Saudi Arabia. Hence, there is a division there. Despite the Sunni-Shia conflict, there is some kind of a political rivalry with Saudi Arabia involving Oman that is almost ancient and it is in part tribal. If he dies, the question will be, or when he dies, the question will be, will the new sultan be anti-Houthi or pro-Houthi? Will he seek a rapprochement with Saudi Arabia or will he persist in sympathy to the Iranian-backed militias fighting against the Saudi-backed government in Yemen? This could become a major development. And it has been announced the Sultan is in a seriously advanced stage of colorectal cancer. Let us progress looking at this week in prophecy. Ishmael's seed will always be divided. Ishmael's seed will always be divided. Esau's sword will always be against his brother. Until and unless the Arab nations accept Jesus and persist in the beliefs of Islam, they will always be a divided people, requiring a common enemy as the only means of not turning against each other. This ancient curse from the book of Genesis is gaining momentum continually once again in the Middle East, and it has gained significant momentum this week in prophecy. The leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon, again, which is aligned to Iran and aligned to the Assad regime in Syria, Hassan Nasrallah, wants the Golan Heights to become a point of military conflict, not only between Hezbollah and Iran and Israel, but Syria, Russia, Hezbollah, and Iran against Israel. And he wants this to concur with a new Hezbollah-led battery of Katusha assaults on Galilee from southern Lebanon. Hence, if there could be some agreement, a coordinated strategy, where a Israeli incursion into Gaza in the south would simultaneously take place with armed conflict, both on the Golan Heights and in northern Galilee, in the area of, of, of Kiryat Shmona and Matula, in the area above Nahariya, we would see quite a situation developing where the Israelis would be forced to resort to stronger and stronger measures. We have a buildup of Russian naval vessels, as we've continually reported, off the coast of Lebanon and Syria, as well as a response by the United States with a aircraft carrier task force. We see a buildup of Israeli troops and reserves on the Golan Heights in response to this large Russian presence. But now an open, open campaign of attack is being pushed by Hezbollah. Now, Nasrallah has a lot of control of Lebanon, not complete, but a fair amount of control of Lebanon and total control of Hezbollah. He has less influence with Russia, Syria, but significant influence with Iran, not so much for military reasons, but for religious and political reasons. He is a factor. He is a player in the game. His words do carry weight. Again, we are seeing the Middle East beginning to boil again, not simmer. Nasrallah made these announcements this week in prophecy. Meanwhile, the division continues in the Arab Muslim world. Not simply the division between the Sunnis and Shias or between the Persian world and the Arab world, that is Iran, the Gulf states, and Saudi Arabia. 
but major divisions are taking place with inside the Sunni world as we speak. This week in prophecy, King Abdullah II, who was unhappy with the Trump administration policies concerning Israel, yet who has absorbed huge numbers of refugees from Syria, finds himself in a precarious situation. But in response to the Saudi Arabian passive sanction of Trump administration policies, he's proclaimed himself the servant of the Qibla and of the third mosque. Now we have to understand what this means in Islam, particularly in Sunni Islam. The Qibla is of course the Kaaba, the stone where the Hajj takes place in Mecca. He's associating himself with it, even though he is not a Saudi, because it is known in the Arab world, although not Saudi, he is Hashemite. He is from the tribe of Muhammad. These things mean things in the Muslim world. They give him a certain position and credibility because of ancestry and dynasty. He's not Saudi. Politically, he's beholden to foreign aid. However, he's a Hashemite. He has a claim that the royal house of Saud does not have to the same degree based on history and ancestry. Now we have to understand this. The Shias claim to be the true Islam based on Ali, who was killed at the Battle of Kabbalah, the great nephew of Muhammad saying that the leadership of Islam should have remained within Muhammad's family, following the tribal mentality of the ancient Near East that still persists in the Bedouin world today and much of the Arab world today. The Sunni response is, we also have people who are related to Muhammad. It's not just based on his theocrats, which went through Abu Bakr. This is the Sunni-Shia split of which the Hashemites are pivotal. Hence this statement by King Abdullah II of Jordan reverberates in Saudi Arabia and in other Sunni Arab countries. Based on his ancestry, he can punch well above his weight, even though in terms of economic significance. Jordan is virtually impoverished and it is in desperate, desperate straits in terms of its very short, critically short water supply. Nonetheless, he also claimed to be a guardian, as it were, of the third mosque, that being Al-Aqsa. So you have the Kaaba, you have the tomb of Muhammad, these are known as the two shrines in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca and Medina respectively, but the third is claimed as the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount just to the south of the Dome of the Rock, sometimes called the Mosque of Omer. People in the West think of the Mosque of Omer with the Golden Dome and, and the inscription that God has no son, Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. Our focus is on that building. The Arab Sunni Muslim focus is on both buildings, the Al-Aqsa Mosque to the south of it. King Abdullah II is named after his great-grandfather, King Abdullah I, who was assassinated in that mosque by the Mufti's men for wanting to make peace with Israel. But now, King Abdullah is not happy with the Trump administration relocating the American embassy to Jerusalem, even though it is in West Jerusalem, not East Jerusalem, which up until 1967 had been Jordanian territory. What's important here is not what it means for relationships between Israel and Jordan or the United States and Jordan, but what it means for relations 
between Saudi Arabia and Jordan. Both are Sunni. Let us continue looking at this. We have to understand something of the nature of the Arab Muslim world that many people in the West simply do not grasp. The quest for leadership. Gamal Abdul Nasser wanted to be the leader of the Arab world because Egypt was the most populous country. Egyptian mullahs want Egypt to be the leader of the Muslim world because it is the academic center of scholarly Islam, al Isra University in Cairo. It has the most Arabs, the most Muslim Arabs. That is Egypt. Now, fortunately, controlled by the Assisi regime, which came to power despite the efforts of Barack Obama to see a pro-terrorist Mati regime that was essentially a government of the Muslim Brotherhood. Barack Obama aligned himself with the Muslim Brotherhood and opposed the Sisi. He wanted what amounted to a terror-supporting regime in Egypt. This was Barack Obama and is what he did. It is what he actually did. Fortunately, thank God, he did not have his way. But now we understand something further. Saudi Arabia has the two shrines. Jordan has a Hashemite dynasty. While the Gulf states and the Saudi Arabians have the oil, the Egyptians have the population and the academics of Islam. Another player. Turkey. For over 500 years, Turkey controlled much of the Muslim world, certainly the Sunni world, including Saudi Arabia. This was during the Ottoman Empire, which was reinvented by Atatuka and then saw a defeat in World War I by the British when they aligned themselves with the Kaiser's Germany. They were defeated by a combination of Australian, New Zealand, and British troops in Israel following the military disaster at the Dardanelles at Gallipoli. With General Allenby, it all changed. The Zionist movement gained momentum as a result of that, and Turkey declined significantly. Recep Erdogan is determined to rebuild Turkey as the leader of the Sunni world. Saudi Arabia, because of its oil and because of its having the two shrines, posts itself as the leader. Egypt, because of its population, posts itself as a leader. And now claims are even coming from Jordan because of ancestry, tribal dynasty going back to the time of Muhammad. What a complicated mess. It just proves what the Word of God says. Ishmael's seed will always be divided, and Esau's sword will always be against his brother. Finally this week, and there's been major news not only in the Middle East but in the West, has been the Jamal Khashoggi affair. This affair has been misrepresented and misreported in the Western press by the left-wing media particularly for a number of reasons. Mr. Khashoggi was a reporter for the American Washington Post. He's been living in the United States in recent months, having left Saudi Arabia when the new crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, came to power. Son of the king, most likely the future king, but now effectively in control of the Saudi Arabian government and economy. He is a reformer. He has made major, major modifications in the enforcement of Sharia and Islamic law, put restrictions on the Mutawa, the religious police, women driving cars. He stopped the Puritan-style Kulta Kampf, 
He's allowing theaters and films and things of this nature. He has a huge, huge youth population reliant on government handouts, which in turn are reliant on nothing but oil production. He realizes that there is a demographic quagmire facing Saudi Arabia, and there must be major changes towards modernization, liberalization, and to a degree at least, westernization. Now, he's not somebody that the West should think is one of us by any means, or even that we should trust by any means. But we do have to understand that he understands the threat of Al-Qaeda, of ISIS, of Iran, certainly, and he understands that Saudi Arabia cannot remain a medieval state, the world's largest oil exporter. He has a lot of enemies. He arrested many of his cousins, other princes, from the House of Saud, which is effectively the government of Saudi Arabia. By arrest that I mean, he confined them to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. This included uh, Prince al Tawit, who ran the kingdom or runs the kingdom fund, uh, bin Talal al Tawid. Uh, let us remember that Al Qaeda was funded by members of the House of Saud, and to this day, the American government has not released those secret 28 pages of the 9 11 report from the commission that would document involvement by agents of the Saudi Arabian government and what happened in the Al-Qaeda attacks on New York and Washington. The Trump administration is hoping, maybe praying, that this prince will continue his reforms, but there is a conflict for power. Again, it involves Jordan, to a lesser degree it involves Egypt, but it certainly involves Turkey and it involves Saudi Arabia. You also have other Gulf states playing for power, such as Qatar, which has made itself a center of internationally broadcasted Arab media, Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera. These things were based in Qatar. Qatar has sought to be a friend of both Iran and the West simultaneously. It's tried to make itself a player. Although a small country, it is oil rich. And it is, again, rising up, and the Saudis do not like it. They're the next-door neighbor, and an unfriendly one. Jordan, the Sultan of Oman, the Saudis are getting nervous. And these things are happening at the same time as the Iranian threat has gained momentum. But it is not only... Qatar, it is the Sultan of Oman, and its other next-door neighbors that have beaten it to the punch in terms of social and economic reform, to a degree Abu Dhabi, but certainly Dubai. In response to this economic challenge for economic precedence, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia is building a huge mega city, almost a state within a state, something along the lines of Singapore, a country within a country or a city that would be a country that would be within Saudi Arabia in northwest Saudi Arabia, close to the Israeli resort and port city of, of Elat, close to to the Jordanian port city of Aqaba and close to the point where Egypt, Israel, and Jordan converge. It is also, interestingly enough, the probable area of the actual Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were given. Nonetheless, he's trying to catch up. Building this closer to the Suez Canal building it opposite Sharm el-Sheikh, building it within driving distance of Eilat and Aqaba, linking Israel, Jordan, and Egypt with Saudi Arabia, 
in this mega city that will be high tech, industrial manufacturing, and so forth. In response to the Khashoggi affair, a trade fair promoting the construction of this new city state, now Mon, or Nami, is in Arabic, is being boycotted by certain other Arab countries and even European powers. This, again, is a reflection of the power struggle and division within the Arab Muslim world and within the Sunni world itself. Hence, the threat to the Saudi position coming from many states, such as Dubai and Abu Dhabi, where the Saudis say, we'll build our own mini-state, a state within a state that will be more liberal, and we will build it close to Egypt, close to Israel, and close to Jordan, and close to the Suez Canal. This is the thinking of the prince strategically and economically. Be that as it may, Turkey has its own ambitions. Hence the Khashoggi affair. There is a strife for power, a striving for power from all of these Sunni states and regimes. Turkey is non-Arab. It's Turkish. Yet it is Muslim. They abandoned the Islamic alphabet and took on Latin letters. They attempted to be under Atatürk, what Japan is, an oriental country with the Western system of government and economy. Well, they tried that, but in the long term, they failed. They have turned increasingly towards Sunni fundamentalism under the despotic regime of the present de facto dictator, Erdogan. Erdogan does not like the Saudis. The Saudis do not like him. Enter Mr. Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist. Again, he was something of a darling of the American left. People like the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, BBC in, in, in Europe and Britain and so forth. The Mont, they liked him because he portrayed himself as a reformer. What was not portrayed is the fact that as a journalist who was educated in the United States, during the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, he befriended Osama bin Laden. Of course, this was before the per se Taliban. It was in the days of the Mujahideen. Nonetheless, he befriended bin Laden. And at the same time, he has always remained a intricate feature within the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is diverse. Its Turkish branch is headed by Erdogan, and it basically controls the Turkish AKP party of Erdogan. In Gaza, it controls Hamas. That's the military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza. They were deposed, thank heavens, by General Assisi when Morsi was taken from power in Egypt but they were controlling the government of Egypt, and it was the Muslim Brotherhood that was essentially responsible for the assassination of Anwar Sadat, again for the crime of making peace or attempting to make peace with Israel and the Jews. Khashoggi is no champion of democracy. He believes in Islamic government. He is Muslim Brotherhood. His marriage was falling to pieces and wanting to get a right of divorce and remarriage, he went with his new girlfriend, cum fiance, to the Saudi consulate, not embassy, their embassy is in Ankara, but the consulate in Istanbul, to obtain the necessary documentation, and he never came out. All kinds of stories have flown around in the left-wing mainstream media in the West. Some that he was physically dismembered, with electric saws and his body carried out piecemeal from, from the uh, consulate complex. Others that hit squads were flown in
from Saudi Arabia on private planes and private jets and things of this nature. Most of these allegations have been disproven, but they were propagated by the government-controlled and the AKP-controlled Turkish media and picked up quickly by his sympathizers in the Western media as if, look what the terrible Saudis did to this liberal reformer. Now, he's Muslim Brotherhood. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia is probably more of a reformer than Khashoggi has ever thought of being, and his actions prove it. Now, again, this is not to say that I love or trust Mohammed bin Salman. It is to say I do not trust any friend of Osama bin Laden or anyone who is associated with, much less a member of, the Muslim Brotherhood. Hence, there's a conflict for leadership in the Sunni world. It involves Egypt, it involves Saudi Arabia, it involves Turkey, it involves the Emirates, it involves Jordan. Ishmael's seed will always be divided. Esau's sword will always be against his brother. He who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The American Secretary of State, Mr. Michael Pompeo, has been dispatched by Mr. Trump to the Middle East. He will be visiting both Turkey and Saudi Arabia and attempting to smooth this over because of the initial knee-jerk reactions by the Americans that there would be ramifications of a negative consequence if he was indeed murdered by the Saudis. The Trump administration is key to defuse this. They know what Khashoggi is and what he isn't. They also know that they have something of a person they can work with at least tentatively in Prince Mohammed bin Salman. They have no interest in a conflict with the Saudi Arabians. Although there has been much propaganda and many speculative editorials that the Saudis would retaliate by canceling arm deals with the United States, they could not easily do that in the face of the Iranian threat. That is not what the pressing reality is in terms of the consequences for the United States if it stood up to the Saudi Arabian government over this Khashoggi affair. Others have said the Saudis would begin pricing oil in local currencies or alternative currencies instead of petrol dollars. Again, that is always a factor in American-Saudi relations. Always a factor. But with an investment portfolio in the United States denominated in dollars at over $1 trillion, it would not be in the economic interest of the Saudi Arabians to really do that. They do not want to see a weakened dollar when the largest segment of their foreign investment is in dollars. Additionally, it would have gross ramifications for their plans to develop a competitive city-state with Dubai and with Abu Dhabi in northwest Saudi Arabia. No, it goes beyond that. But it also goes beyond politics, economics, and strategic considerations. It goes to what the Word of God says and will happen in the last days. What a confused mess. The Sunnis are not united except in their hatred of the Shias. The Shias are really not united except in their hatred of Israel and of Sunnis. Russia is a declining state economically. It needs higher oil prices desperately, and it's trying to save face. No one nation is holding all the cards although the United States still holds more of the cards than anyone else. Once again, we need to pray for President Trump, Vice President Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, for the National Security Advisor, John Bolton particularly. We also need to pray for Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's pray against the regime in Iran. But how do you pray? 
Right now, it is to Israel's functional advantage to have good relations with Erdogan, even though we know what Erdogan would do to Israel if he had the chance. These are alliances of convenience that are very, very complicated. King Abdullah does not like the Trump administration's policies in Jerusalem, but he needs the United States. How do you pray? Well, we pray in the spirit, and some Christians believe that when we don't know how to pray with our mind, the gift of tongues can be effectively used in prayer in that situation because the Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Father. I do not dispute that. We have to pray, thy will be done. We have to pray for our own governments and leaders. We have to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we have to pray for the salvation of Jews, Arabs, all Muslims alike. This week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash, Morial Ministries. God bless and thank you for listening. <laughs>